Okay. Uh, thank you, Dan, and thank you to all of you who are uh, joining at home uh, or elsewhere. Uh, I, I, I will I'll summarize the book in the following way. Uh, the year 2020 was a, uh, a, a watershed in, uh, in the history of the United States and Britain, basically of the, of the Western world. Um, I, I argue in my book that the reason that we should see it as a watershed is because um, during, during that year, the hegemony of a set of ideas, which we can call enlightenment liberalism, um, that had been dominant in America, in Europe, in English-speaking countries, and uh, and in other places for 60 or 70 years, that hegemony, that post-World War II hegemony of of, uh, of liberalism, uh, collapsed. Now that that doesn't mean that there aren't many people who who are still liberal and many people who think as liberals, uh, but the uh, the when I say hegemony, I mean that that. Uh, the that uh, uh, the conditions of overwhelming dominance, which made it uh, difficult for any other kinds of ideas to 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 push their way through and get uh, traction in the public arena, uh, that that uh, dominance, that uh, almost exclusivity, came to an end. It came to an end with, uh, on the one hand, uh, the the rise of for you know, for want of a, a better term, a woke neo-Marxism, uh, which in an astonishing with astonishing speed succeeded in in launching its own bid to to establish dominance in America and Britain and elsewhere. And uh, at, at at the same time, I think on the right, we've also seen um, the uh, uh, the the withdrawal of um, right of center versions of liberalism to a certain extent. And uh, the rise of uh, a whole bunch of other different uh, kinds of ideas. Um, I, I, I myself am associated with a uh, with a stream that that calls itself national conservatism or nationalist conservatism, uh, and 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 there are very various other uh, other things that we could talk about. Now, I think the uh, the most important thing to notice about this uh, shift is that. We're we're in the midst of a uh, of a struggle for what you know for what it, what what is going to replace liberalism. Uh, my assumption is that it, it is, is not going to be some form of liberalism that's going to replace liberalism. People can argue about that, but um, I, I I think that the the problems with uh, liberal ideas are sufficiently great so that. Uh, liberalism is in fact what brought us to this condition, or we, we can uh, describe this slightly differently and say that, uh, that most leading uh, liberal thinkers, whether intellectuals or public figures, uh, assumed that, uh, that the assumptions of liberalism, uh, which we can, you know, we can quickly name uh, all human beings are, 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 are free and equal, uh, human beings take on ob obligations um, uh, in general, take on obligations only to which they consent uh, that human beings are, uh, uh, are capable of exercising reason and uh, reaching more or less the same conclusions about what the best life is. All of these assumptions are assumptions that, um, that by the 1960s were dominant and uh, many, most of the people who subscribed to them probably thought that they were going to last forever. Some people even talked about, you know, history coming to an end and uh, liberalism being adopted by everybody in the world. Uh, I don't think anybody thinks thinks that anymore. And a, a, a more accurate view is to say that Enlightenment liberalism and its uh, post-war variety um, lasted two generations and and uh, and, uh, and 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 then gave up the ghost and uh, the, the the reasons for that we can we can get into but just looking at it um, I think I think it's fair to say that it seems very unlikely that uh, that a worldview that uh, is capable of maintaining itself through time for only a couple of generations uh, is going to be the ultimate worldview that's going to take over the whole world um, let, let's talk a little bit about, about conservatism, which is the, the, the main subject of the book. Um, conservatism is a, uh, is, 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 uh, 
uh, a political worldview that um, that is based on the idea that that um, the religious and national traditions are the key to uh, maintaining and strengthening a nation through time. Uh, there are different kinds of conservatisms. Uh, in, in my book, I focus on Anglo-American conservatism, that is the, the particular conservative tradition uh, that, that uh, we can trace in, you know, in, in England back for many centuries. Uh, I, I, I start in the 1400s, but it's uh, uh, but you can go back a lot further, further than that. And the claim is that, that uh, in Britain and America and English speaking countries, um, there, there developed and still exists to a certain degree, a, a con conservative tradition, which is uh, distinct from any kind of liberalism. Uh, that conservative tradition is associated um, in, in the first case with uh, with uh, uh, the, the English nation, the English constitution, English common law and language, uh, and, uh, and other attri attributes of, uh, of uh, first England and later Britain. And uh, that, uh, that much of this is, is, is brought to the United States by, uh, by, by colonists from, from Britain. Uh, and, and, and that the American constitution and the American political tradition is and, and this I know is controversial for, for some people, but uh, the, the American constitution and political tradition is a, a local variant uh, adapted to, to local conditions. And, and there really were conservatives in America too. So we, we, we can get into that now. Um, when we talk about uh, conservatism today, I think a lot of young people are frequently, frequently uh, ask, why do you call yourself a conservative? What nonsense? Uh, or maybe they're a little bit more respectful and they don't say what nonsense. They just, they, they just say, why do you call yourself a conservative? Isn't it clear to you that conservatives have not conserved anything, are not conserving anything? I think this, this is an extremely important question. And in, in fact, it's the, the central question around which, um, which my book is built. And um, my, my, my argument is that the, the, the main reason that conservatives have not been conserving anything or not conserving very much is because uh, what goes by the name, of, what has gone by the name of conservatism, at least for the last 30 years in the United States and Britain, is just a form of liberalism. I've already mentioned some of the problems with liberalism, but uh, the, the, the burden of, of, of this book is to show you that there, uh, there did exist a, uh, a long tradition of uh, thinkers in the UK, uh, prominent names include John Fortescue, uh, John Selden, uh, uh, Matthew, Matthew Hale, Blackstone, and all that you know, for centuries before you get to Edmund Burke, and that that tradition um, uh, establishes the American Constitution uh, in 1787, at the hands of the what later get is called the American Federalist Party. So I I, I argue that that uh, that the that the American Federalists were the original national conservatives, the original NatCons, uh, and uh, that the Constitution that they wrote um, is uh, uh, is something that is in many many respects very similar to the English Constitution. Now, let's let's go back to our situation today. Um, we, we have two, two problems to deal with in, in conditions in which the tradition, these traditions that I'm talking about have to a large degree been uprooted. Uh, many, many young people, maybe most have grown up uh, in, in, uh, in homes that do not recognize much of the traditional religious or national, uh, the, 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 the religious and, and national traditions that, that, that we're talking about. And, and so, um, for the subject to be of more than you know his, historical interest, uh, we would need to deal with with two big topics. One of them is uh, is there any kind of hope for a restoration or a revival of uh, this Anglo-American conservative tradition at the political level, at the national level, uh, or, or at the state level? Um, uh, I, I mean, if we think about the, the the big political question of, okay, America is not going to continue to be a liberal country. It will it, it is 
tending towards being some, some kind of neo-Marxist country. If we want to stop it, then what kind of conservatism could there be that could actually um, turn the country towards a, a national life of uh, conservation and transmission uh, w w when, when conservation and transmission has, has been cut off for decades? So there's this big macro political question. My book also deals with uh, the lives of private individuals, because what, one, one of the central um, changes that I think that we need to make in the way that we view the world is uh, we need to stop thinking about, um, about public life and conservatism and the, you know, the good of the nation as something that is restricted only to the political arena, which is, you know, for most people just voting and, you know, and, and uh, watching, watching the news or, 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 or videos. And we need to shift to a view that regards um, being a conservative person, leading a conservative life as the, the most important step that mo the overwhelming majority of people will ever make in order to uh, to make America or any other country a conservative country uh, is is the things that people do in their in in their private lives. Uh, there's a difference between individuals, families, um, uh, congregations, and communities, which are focused on the life of conservation and transmission. Those kinds of communities are are capable of raising up. Uh, leadership that understands what a life of conservation and transmission is about. And those people are capable of, of representing those kinds of views in, 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 uh, in the broader sphere. But to know anything about it at all, you would have to be someone who doesn't just read books, because conservatism isn't really something that you can learn out of books. You can't even learn it out of a whole library of books. Conservatism is a skill, it's conserving and transmitting ideas, behaviors, and institutions as a skill. And for that skill to be something that you yourselves possess, you need to learn it from actual people, not, not, not from reading about it. It's like, you know, you can't, you, 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 you don't know how to bake a cake or how to fly a kite from, from reading about it. You, you know these things because you learned from a person who knows how to do it and how to do it well. And so a, a significant part of the book um, describes uh, the, 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 the life of conservative people. There's also a personal chapter about me and my wife uh, in college and, and how we, we decided to, to, uh, to turn our, our backs on leading a liberal life and to uh, plug into uh, a conservative life. This, this involved um, uh, joining an Orthodox Jewish congregation and community. At, at, at this point, we've been Orthodox Jews for uh, for a generation, we're, we're now having uh, our, our uh, we, have, we have nine children and three grandchildren live in Jerusalem, um, and I'm 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 happy to to say say more about this. But the uh, the the book argues that uh, Orthodox Christian communities and congregations and Orthodox Jewish communities and congregations are among the only places where you can actually become a part of a life of conservation and transmission. And so the, the, the whole subject um, of you know, the, the big political ideas of, of conservatism um, ends up having a lot to do with the question of, you know, can, are, are we able to conserve, trans, uh, conserve and transmit traditions of any kind? Uh, the book argues that we can, uh, which may be counterintuitive, but that's what I argue. And I'm happy to discuss uh, any aspect of this. Great, thank you very much, Professor Hazoni. So I, and I, I'm definitely gonna come back to that point about living a conservative life because I think it's one of the most innovative aspects of the book. Uh, well, there's a lot of them, but, but especially just rel the whole framing relative to other books about conservatism. Uh, it's rare to have something get this personal, but let's, let's start with the approach to politics. I, I think that, you know, you sketch this conservative approach to politics. I don't think you're going to find too many readers that dispute that this is a conservative approach to politics and that it's more conservative than the versions of conservatism that are more influenced by enlightenment liberalism now but i'm sure you know you must have thought about this a lot beforehand there's there's this danger you confront people with the starker alternative some of them are going to say well if that is conservatism that's why i'm not a conservative right i don't want this is in fact i'm sure 
there must be liberals reading this book who say, you see, you know, they, he gives the game away. We've been telling you these conservatives, they hate the Enlightenment, they hate the Declaration of Independence, they hate feminism, they want an established Christian church. Look, Hazoni has said it, that's why we're liberals. So I want, I want to, you know, to get people to think about that alternative, I, I want to push you on a few aspects of conservatism as, as you depicted in the book. And one of them is our national traditions. You know, you, you're, you've, you, uh, one of the things you seem to be doing is, is resuscitating certain aspects of our own national tradition that people today have gotten uncomfortable with, but that you're obviously very comfortable with. I, I love some of those quotes from FDR that you found uh, that would have gotten him called a theocrat by our modern media, but this is Franklin Delano Roosevelt we're talking about. On the other hand, there are parts of our own national tradition that, you, that really do seem to have been influenced by Enlightenment liberalism and that you don't have as much use for. And they include the Declaration of Independence, they include the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln's wartime rhetoric more generally, you would, which you admit had a kind of Jeffersonian flavor to it. What does a Burkean traditionalist do when the national traditions that he wants to conserve are themselves influenced in part by anti-conservative liberalism? Well, you, you know, I, I don't, um... I, I I don't have a uh, um, I, I don't I don't think it's necessary to to go all the way and say uh, you know the the only worthwhile traditions are conservative traditions. Um, every you know every nation is a is a mix. I mean it's kind of kind of a a, a, mo a modern myth that it's possible to have a homogenous nation. Uh, where you know where everybody kind of uh, is the same in some way believes the same things, uh, so I I don't think America is especially un, unusual in in that um, that it, uh, it it its founders its founding uh, reflects a contest between uh, between these two important uh, Anglo traditions the 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 liberal the liberal tradition and the conservative tradition and the um, the Jeffersonian version is the version from which we get uh, the the you know the this sort of mo modern uh, uh, libertarian uh, kind of intuition that goes um, all government is you know is bad government government doesn't have any responsibilities other than you know to prevent me from punching you in the nose but you know or or prevent Another country from punching us in the nose, but be, beyond that, government should should uh, is basically illegitimate and shouldn't exist. Um, we get that from you know the, the, from the Jeffersonian the, the Jeff, Jeffersonian party, um, and uh, and and at, at this point, I think an awful lot of people have worked very hard to forget that there was a conservative party which was responsible for writing you know for for, for writing the constitution. Uh, 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 you, you, uniting the states into a single nation, uh, and and enacting uh, the, the 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 earliest American government traditions. So, how how do I view it? I view it as a um, you know this the same way that I view lo lots of the histories of many other countries that I I I, I think one side is. Uh, uh, is is better and more thoughtful and more useful and more right, and I think the other side is is mistaken. Uh, but um, but you know the the the, the um, um, things don't really go haywire in the United States on my reading um, until after World War II. So um, a, a lot of what people like about America. Um, it is it is probably some kind of a mix, you know, as as you're suggesting when you know when when you talk about uh, Lincoln's wartime rhetoric, which it, which really is a, a fascinating mix between um, you know sort of Je Jeffersonian Jeffersonian universal principles and um, and federalist uh, nationalism and and biblicism and uh, uh, you know all, uh, all of these 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 powerful Christian Christian and Old Testament roots, without which, you know, it, it, it's not clear that America could have actually survived the war. And and both of these tendencies, um, you find them in in Lincoln, you find them in Grant. Anyway, I can like I can like more some things more than other things, but I don't think that's really important. I think what's important is that after World War II, the United States, after the two world wars, uh, America and Europe go through a very, very deep trauma. And the result of that trauma is that the, the balance between 
um, traditional liberalism and conservatism uh, is wrecked. I mean, we, you know, we, we can argue about exactly why, but I think it's hard to dispute that what, what, what happens after World War II is that for the first time um, in, uh, I, I think that the, the, the first crucial year is 1947 when the United States Supreme Court for the first time um, sets out to uh, declare a separation of church and state and impose it on uh, all of the American states. At that point, and, and in the years following that, um, Enlightenment li liberalism just wins outright. It becomes, it, it, it's not one of two or three different traditions, it becomes the tradition. And you, you start finding uh, scholars claiming that there never was conservatism in the United States. I mean, th there's some very famous books by prominent profess professors uh, from the 1950s that set out to show we never had any conservatism at all. So, I mean, th there's, there's really the, uh, the attempt to erase American conservatism. Um, at this point, I think it, it, it you can say, with only a little tiny, tiny bit of exaggeration, but not much, that Jefferson displaces Washington uh, as the founding father of the United States. And you know, if if you try to talk to people about uh, about Washington and his party and its its nationalist and Christian and traditionalist uh, and uh, uh, Anglo pro Anglo uh, views, uh, you kind of even people call themselves conservatives, you often get kind of like a blank stare and they start saying, you know, well, that they, they were all Jeffersonians, basically. That's more, you don't believe me. No, no, I, I do. Oh, Sorry. I, oh I, you do I, believe I, me. I, I, I thought you were saying, oh, come on, you've gone too far. Was it? No, no, no I've met people it, you're talking it's, about. Okay, so um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking a little too long, but the bottom line is uh, I'm not asking people to, um, to uh, despise uh, everything about the other party, the Liberal Party, and I'm not asking everybody to give up every, you know, every every thought and feeling that they have been sentiment that, that that's liberal, uh, but I am asking people to uh, to distinguish between the two things. Liberalism and conservatism are extremely different things, even in America, they're extremely different things, and the thing that we need now, if we want to say, see a future for uh, for America and for the whole democratic world is um, is a rediscovery of conservatism because liberalism is not going to help us right now. Okay, thank you. Great. I should make actually before I go on, I should make one uh, this public service announcement that I made at the beginning. Uh, I I would love to talk to Professor Hazoni for the next thirty four minutes uh, if you all don't feel like asking questions, but you do have the opportunity to ask questions in the Q and A feature. Uh, and if you do, in about 10 or 15 minutes, I will turn to reading those aloud. So please feel free. Again, it's the Q&A feature of Zoom. Uh, you put them in the queue and, and I will get to reading them aloud uh, just a little bit later. But for now, let, let me push a little bit more on a couple of those aspects of conservatism that I think are most likely today to make people, including people who would like to call themselves conservatives, somewhat uncomfortable with the kind of deeper, more thoroughgoing conservatism that you're talking about. And one of those uh, is race, which comes up a number of times. Uh, in your book, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to read aloud a, a sentence or two from your introduction, which really intrigued me, and then I was a little disappointed to find that you didn't follow up on as specifically in the rest of the book as I was hoping, so, so I'm going to ask you to now. Okay. Uh, the, the great triumph of liberal ideas after World War II has left nothing stable and permanent in its wake. Even its most important achievement, the desegregation of the American South and the putative end of racially based laws and social norms in America, now seems to have been achieved superficially without arriving at a settlement that could endure the test of generations. So I'm wondering, can you elaborate on that criticism? What do you mean about this failure of the civil rights movement to achieve a, a lasting settlement? Uh, going together with that, how could, in your view, how could the civil rights movement have looked different if it had been a more conservative movement? And how might a conservative today approach this problem that you're diagnosing, this continued lack of, of I think what you call a stable racial settlement in this country. Okay, it, it's a it, it, it's a great question. Uh, it, the, there, there's a, a few parts. The first thing I think that's important to notice is that um, is that the 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 claims by um, pro-slavery Southerners uh, to um, to be defending you know their own legitimate tradition uh, those are not those are not claims that. 
uh, that the rest of us have to simply accept at face value. I mean, it, 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 it's certainly true that uh, that, that there, there were traditions of, uh, of uh, slavery in the American South, which you know, I, I, I personally, as somebody who, who, who takes uh, the Bible seriously and the biblical uh, narrative about uh, the enslavement of, of uh, the Jews in Egypt seriously, um, I, I think that those traditions were, were, uh, were evil. And, uh, but, but even people who are not coming from that perspective I think it's important to, to know that, um, that the, the, uh, the English legal and constitutional tradition is one that, uh, had, uh, that never really had any kind of basis for, for slavery. I'm talking about going, going, going back 700, 800 years. The, it, it is, uh, the story of English constitutionalism is, is one of the, develop, of, of the development of a culture uh, in which slavery, uh, the kind of slavery that we had in the, that we saw in the American South, uh, was illegitimate. And when there was an attempt in uh, uh, at the end of the 1600s and during the 1700s to find a place for slaveholding in England, the uh, the outcome was that the conservative uh, English legal establishment. Uh, determined that slavery simply was not something that could take place in English soil. Their ultimate determination was that uh, if if a if an enslaved person sets foot in England, he 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 becomes a free man. Now that's a very very strong uh, tradition uh, in uh, Anglo-American tradition that that I think uh, uh, Americans can be proud of, and um, I, I I don't think that there's something wrong with the strategy of the civil rights movement, um, with, which instead of, instead of relying on, uh, on the, the, uh, the common law history, decided to, uh, to rely on uh, abstract uh, declarations of equal rights. I, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with it. I mean, like that, that, that's a technical argument we could get into. I don't think that that was a terrible mistake. The, but there was a terrible mistake, I think, in uh, in 1960s and the the the, the, the Civil Rights Act and, and the rest of the effort to eliminate eliminate the persecution of blacks in America. Let let's say for a moment that we can all agree um, that uh, that that uh, uh, all uh, all men are created in God's image. A uh, modern formulation of that is is uh, that that uh, that that people are equal and they shouldn't be. Uh, abused because uh, because they're black rather than white, we can all agree on that, and it's just fine to say um, uh, civil liberties in the United States, in both uh, public and private sphere, uh, are are henceforth going to uh, uh, move in the direction of eliminating discrimination on the basis of 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 one's the color of one's skin or one's race. I think all of that's fine. Uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it's, a, it's a highly defensible way of going about the absolutely crucial job of eliminating the persecution on the basis of, 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 uh, of race of blacks in America. But take a look at what the Civil Rights Act did. Instead of saying we have this one job to do, and our job is to eliminate um, uh, persecution of blacks, they came out of the Second World War with this drive to eliminate all historical injustices that anyone could think of um, using this tool of uh, e equal rights and non-discrimination. Now, we just agreed that this tool could be uh, just perfectly fine as, and maybe, you know, as, as the tool that you're going to use legally to eliminate persecution of Blacks. But that doesn't mean that that tool can then be sort of cookie cutter replicated um, uh, because we're not going to discriminate against uh, be between blacks and whites, we also are not going to legally distinguish between men and women. We also are not going to legally distinguish between Christians and Jews and atheists. We also are not going to legally distinguish between uh, uh, be between uh, uh, American natives and foreign nationals, uh, uh, or or of nationals of different countries. They're all going to be treated equally. It, and and once you're in this cookie cutter mode of thinking that this anti-race tool can be used to solve all 
social and uh, uh, historical problems between groups, then there's no end. Then you say, okay, so uh, we don't allow discrimination on the basis of age. We don't allow discrimination, discrimination on the basis of physical ability. We don't allow discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. You can just keep going. I mean, you could just do this forever. And every single step that you take along the way is as, uh, as Edmund Burke would have said, is uh, that, that in, instead of uh, passing a law to repair a particular problem uh, whose consequences you can you know, basically hopefully foresee and it's small enough so you can go back if you screw it up somehow, instead of doing that, you, 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 you uh, legislate these sweeping abstract thoughts about how all human beings can be equal and discrimination cannot exist among them. And those thoughts, there's no possible way of foreseeing what everybody's gonna do with those principles as soon as they've been legislated. And so I, I actually think that, that out of that 1960s, that well-intentioned effort to try to solve all of history's um, uh, problems using civil rights law, I, I, I think that, uh, that uh, America opened a Pandora's box, which has uprooted all kinds of traditions, bad, but also uh, the, the things that held the country together. Um, so yeah. uh, I'll just name one thing, uh, the, the, which is the, the, the elimination of uh, any reference to God, prayer, uh, the Bible, religion, uh, even the Bible is the basis of civilization um, from the American schools uh, was, I think, uh, a decisive step towards eliminating the legitimacy of public religion uh, in America. And uh, today it's being, you know, Christianity is, is, is being superseded by, the, by, by a new religion, the religion of woke neo-Marxism. Uh, and still Christians don't feel that they can fight for the public space in America because of things that happened in the 1960s. Okay, great, thank you. So let, um, that was race. I'm gonna do one more, which is sex, which you already brought up, the distinction between men and women, um, because you know you, you, you go through this long list of conservative thinkers, Fortescue on down through Washington and Adams. As far as I know, every one of these thinkers was perfectly fine with coverture laws, no women's suffrage, restrictions on women's role in public, all sorts of things. Uh, that that are completely gone from the world. I'm not I'm not asking what you would have thought about those older arrangements in their in their own time and place, but I, I am asking what does it even mean today to apply this tradition of what clearly was non-feminist conservatism to our situation today, where our social arrangements are, are radically different. And I'm asking both on a on a public level and national level, but also about to come to what you talk about at the end of the book. You know, trying to live. Conserv live a conservative life on a personal level, what would you say to young men and women who are trying to figure out specifically what it means to live as a conservative man or as a conservative woman uh, and what roles they should take on in the world that we live in, the modern world? Okay, well, I, 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 I don't, I, I definitely don't, don't, uh, you know, don't, don't see too many people um, um, uh, picking, you know, uh, the year, 1600 and saying, uh, let's go back to whatever the arrangements were then. I mean, that kind of thing is in any case impossible. I mean, as, as you know, that there are some people on the, on the fringes of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the American right who, who spend a lot of time engaging in kind of uh, uh, fanciful reconstructions of, of you know, e either long gone historical periods or you know, kind of high-tech futuristic uh, imagination of what could replace the American Constitution. Um, I, I, I think we we do have to work with what we have, and uh, you know, human beings are you know, we, uh, the, 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 they they can't undergo um, all fronts revolution simultaneously without disaster. I mean, so 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 I I, I don't I don't think we should be trying to do that. Um, I do think that what we should be doing is um, is uh, experimenting with restoring uh, significant parts of uh, uh, of the tradition. Um, uh, Selden and Burke argue that uh, you should not be going back, you know, as far in history as you can. That the that that the goal of a re of a restoration in the conservative tradition is 
to try to get back to the point where things, things went uh, off the rails and to try to uh, repair, restore as much as possible the relevant conditions from that time. So um, I, 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 don't, I don't know of any particular reason to, for, for us to be talking right now about, uh, uh, about eliminating uh, women's suffrage. I think much, much more important um, is, uh, is a, uh, people like to use the word reckoning, um, a, a, a reckoning uh, about the destruction of the family, um, which has left men, women, and children, uh, elderly people, and young people um, uh, devastated. I mean, we realistically, we now live in a time in which even a couple that, you know, that wants to get married um, uh, and have, ch have children, that, Everybody has difficult with this. They have, they have difficulty getting married. They have difficulty staying married. They have difficulty deciding to have kids. Difficulty to actually raising them, and 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 then the, there's you know the, this terrible um, uh, li liberal concept uh, that that um, uh, that that I th I think should just be discarded. That uh, the that the children only owe their parents things up until the age of 18 or 20. And then at that point, they're, you know, they're rash, free rational beings, just like their parents are. So they're equal to their parents. And, uh, and the, the, the practical impact of this on, uh, on uh, uh, life in America and, and in many other countries is, uh, is that kids go away to college and then they never come back. And uh, they, 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 uh, they cut their ties with their parents, with their grandparents, with community um, at, at where they grew up. They have no roots, and they go to universities which specialize in 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 uh, in teaching, you know, uh, liberalism or Marxism, both of which, in different ways, are are hostile to the whole idea of uh, of of a human being who owes something uh, to the past. So we've reached the point where it is exceedingly difficult for people who want to, to engage in anything remotely looking like traditional family life. Um, so I, 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 as I, as I write, write, write in, the, in, in the book, um, uh, my wife and I in college, we, we, we made the decision that we were going to uh, to join an Orthodox uh, Jewish congregation, we ended up uh, uh, moving to Israel, and we, to this day we uh, we, we live in, an, in in a mostly Orthodox uh, neighborhood that, where the, there, there's the, there's ten or fifteen uh, little synagogues in our neighborhood of every different possible flavor of Orthodox Judaism, and um, and uh, and and we raise our kids in in that way, and we're thankful that. Uh, that so far all of our kids, um, the, uh, including the ones who are um, um, married and having children, they all live in Jerusalem. Some of them live in our neighborhood, and um, and 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 we think that this is a much better life. Now, um, does that mean that if if you're a feminist, you you, uh, you will sacrifice nothing in order to? Get what I think is a better life, and my wife thinks is a better life. No, you, that it doesn't mean that. Uh, if you go to our local Orthodox synagogue, then then you will see that the the that the 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 prayer services are uh, are 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 led by men, and there's a a, a, a divider. Uh, between the men's section and the the women's women section, no, the women are not sitting in the back. But that that that's that doesn't really change the fact that uh, uh, the women are on the left side and the men are on the uh, right side. And if that kind of thing, um, if if you find if that rem if you think that that's the kind of the same kind of sin as you know making blacks sit in the back of the bus and whites sit in the front of the bus, then you're going to have a real hard time with these customs. But um, what I would say is that um, that I think people have gone so far that uh, and, and, and they're so miserable in so many ways. I mean, the way that the ways that Jordan Peterson describes young men and the way that Abigail Schreier describes young women. I mean, look, this is I mean, this is this is this is this is a horrific time to, for, for young people to be growing up rootless. And uh, and I think that before you rule it rule it out, you should spend time in a in a functional working 
um, uh, Orthodox Christian or Orthodox Jewish community and come there as somebody wants to learn instead of as somebody who is, you know, already knows all the answers and can just rule it all out. Great, thank you. I, I actually would love to follow up on that, but right now I'm getting a bunch of questions in the chat and I want to, I want to start reading a few of those. Several of them- I finally annoyed people enough, so they'll ask questions. <laughs> I just remind everybody who's here who hasn't already done so, please feel free to use the Q&A feature on Zoom. Uh, and I will do my best to, to select ones, especially ones that are coming up more than once. And the following is coming up more than once. I'm, I'm glad I guessed correctly that our PD audience would have this question, uh, which is about your view of the nature of human reason. Um, so I'll, I'll give my version of this, which is this book that we're talking about. Um, this is an extremely well-reasoned book. Uh, and, and I've occasionally been tempted to say that it single-handedly refutes its own claims about the weakness of human reason. And so uh, talk a little bit about this. You know, you're, you're obviously in favor of reasoning in matters of political philosophy. You lay out a lot of truths about human nature and the nature of human societies. You also have a serious criticism of rationalists who claim to offer some universally valid theory of politics and human nature. So just draw out for us, because a bunch of people are asking about this. What is this, your distinction between good ways and bad ways to use our reason when we're trying to do moral, social, and political philosophy? Okay, look, it, it's it's a wonderful question. And, uh, you know, uh, 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 unfortunately, something that we we, uh, we we really need a lot of time to go into in detail. So I'll just, so I, I'm, I'm going to lay it out in brush strokes. Please, please do not think that I'm trying to convince you in five minutes to change your whole view of what reason is, all right? I'm, I'm answering in brush strokes, um, read the book. The book will open new possibilities to you and you still won't be convinced, but it's worth beginning the conversation about it. Okay, the, 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 um, the Enlightenment rationalists, you know, which is the stream that, that includes uh, Descartes and Hobbes and uh, um, uh, Locke's second treaties and, and uh, Spinoza, R R Rousseau's social contract, Kant's political writings, that stream assumes all sorts of things about reason that I think most people today just don't, don't believe anymore. Um, the Enlightenment rationalists thought that it was possible to uh, isolate um, either clear and distinct ideas or self-evident uh, 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 principles, which everyone who was exercising reason would be able to agree that they were correct. And from there, deduce uh, by infallible deductions, as Descartes says, um, conclusions that would be absolute universal, not just universally valid, but that any thinking person would come to, the, to, come to those conclusions you still run into people who think this kind of thing. Um, I mean, for, 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 for example, um, I, you know, I, I, I spent, I did a three hour conversation with Yaron Brook, Yaron Brook from the, the, uh, uh, the Ayn Rand Institute. And, and he mostly thinks that, and there, there are quite a few people who still think that kind of thing, that, that there's really one set of answers that all reasoning people have to come to about morals, about politics, about religion, about how to live. Now, conservatives have always, meaning at every historical stage, both before the birth of liberalism, during its rise, and now today, conservatives in the Anglo-American tradition and elsewhere have thought that that is not true, that it's, it, it is utterly false, that they're uh, th there, there may be, uh, or I, I guess most Christians and Jews would would, would say uh, there are um, uh, universal truths that uh, that are visible to God because He knows a lot more than we do about things. But as far as human beings are concerned, uh, our capacity for uh, for reason. Um, operates differently in different cultures. I mean, we, 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 all, we, we may all have the same, uh, you know, basic infrastructure for how, how our mind works, but in the 1600s, uh, Selden already says explicitly, um, different people have different experiences. Their minds collect and grab from experience in different ways. That means that every, every um, culture will have different basic concepts and its conclusions are going to be extremely different. Okay, so, so conservatives are not, they're not anti-reason, 
um, you know, we, we, we all love reason as much as the next guy when it's, when it's done really well. The problem is that the, the enlightenment liberal assumption that most people can do it well and that most people will come to the same conclusions and that those conclusions are gonna be liberal ones. Um, I, th those things aren't true. And so um, what I propose in the book is a, um, is a, a, a description of the way that, that public reasoning takes place in conservative societies, which I, 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 I know reasonably well from, uh, 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 especially from, from Orthodox Jewish societies, but I've, I've had experience with Christian societies and others. And I think, I, I, I think that, that the main shift is to, it is in understanding that in conservative societies, reasoning is a, it's a collective effort. It's something that you take part in the reasoning of the community. Um, and and the, 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 the answers to various questions are arrived at over generations. They're not arrived at, you know, in, in you know, with, within the next uh, hour of thought or within the next semester of thought. Um, so the, there is such a thing as a conservative view of reason. It's much more constructive than uh, enlightenment reasoning because enlightenment reasoning, uh, enlightenment rationalism, as Descartes says, it, you, you begin by throwing everything out. And conservative constructive reasoning isn't of that kind. You, you begin with a certain community or a certain nation, a certain tradition, that you're hoping to, um, uh, to conserve, you recognize uh, that you've inherited um, problems with it, problems that can include um, that it no longer works, that it no longer makes sense, that it, that it is unjust in some way. Um, maybe it's gone off the rails in some direction, you need to restore it. All of those things are familiar, but constructive reasoning is about repair and restoration rather than starting from scratch. Okay, great. But then, so let me let me follow up on that a little bit though, because I, I think I have a sense of what some of our um, some of our readers are ask are interested in about this question, and and you know you you can gather this potential area of disagreement from from a lot of the stuff we publish at PD. I, I noticed in the book there's one point at which you say you, you've that, published you've you've published me as well, so it, that's it's, true. No, we have a, we have a great it's a diversity. Plural, it's of, a pluralistic tradition. It absolutely is. We're very proud of that. We've written about that too. Um, <laughs> but. Um, but you know, there is one point in the book where you say, and I'm going to give a couple of quotes, traditional concepts, and you name as examples, you give man and woman, which you say are not accessible to reason alone. And later you say the distinction between man and woman actually has its basis in the Bible. And that took me aback a little bit. Um, I, I tend towards the, the kinder cop, kindergarten cop view of the difference between man and woman, the wonderful Arnold Schwarzenegger movie that I recommend to everybody. I won't quote it I for being recorded, but um, say a little bit more about why, I mean, I guess I, I kind of think that distinction is accessible to reason alone. Um, so why, why do you dispute that? Look, I, the, the reason, the, I, I'm not, okay, look, I'm, the, the, the position that I'm, uh, I'm proposing is, is not relativism. It's not the position that says, it, Every kind of thing that it, uh, uh, every culture that you can come up with reasons differently, and therefore there's no way to get to truth. Okay, no, I, I but but I, I want to make sure people hear me say this. Um, I, I, I'm part of a uh, a biblical tradition. I do believe there's such a thing as truth. Um, I, I I I do believe that that uh, uh, that 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 gifted people uh, at at different times in history have have uh, brought mankind and particular civilizations and nations closer to truth. And I believe that, that we should also struggle, struggle, struggle with our, our abilities to get closer to truth. So I believe all of those things. Um, but at, at the same time, I think that, um, that many, um, many religious people, um, especially uh, in particular, my, my, my many good friends um, who, who are uh, spend a lot of uh, time thinking about and developing the, the natural, na natural law tradition. I, I think that many of my good natural lawyer friends um, exaggerate the capacity of uh, to, 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 to reach solid and unequivocal answers. And um, so 
just for example, uh, I, 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 I've i known plenty of Marxists and I, um, uh, I even have friends who are Marxists. <laughs> and uh, um, I mean, I try to get them to stop, but but I do, I have friends who, who, who are Marxists. And, um, and the, um, the thing that's striking about the argument between uh, the supporters, the, the advocates of, of rationalist natural law theory and, uh, and the environment in which they're living is, is that there are just so many, um, you know, really, really intelligent people uh, working, using reason in, uh, in, uh, in ways that are, that are actually impressive, uh, who are coming to completely different conclusions. Now, I, I don't mean, you know, that everybody who, you know, who, who works in critical race theory is, is you know, like is, is, is a genius or, or exercising reason well. What I mean is, is, is that the, the arguments of, um, of really good Marxists, the arguments of really good Marxists against um, uh, various inherited traditions, whether Catholic, Jewish, biblical, rationalist, their arguments are often really good. Like when, if you, if you study them seriously, you learn all sorts of things. You find all sorts of mistakes. You, I mean, it, it, it's absurd to be. I think it's absurd to be saying that the best of these people are are are, are all motivated motivated by emotion or something, and that and 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 or, or and and that they're not reasoning well. I think they're I think they're reasoning really well. I, I even I, I've I, I've I have found really really good examples of reasoning also on also on the far right, and and look it, it's just look at all the look at this this profusion of of different schools of thought that happen as soon as you know as soon as like the the the, tra the traditional framework collapses. There's this all these different schools of thought. Many of them are led by people who are really really smart. And they still they reach conclusions which are which are horrific and utterly evil, and um, and so uh, so as as far as man and woman, I think that what happened is that that um, there were always you know people always knew about uh, uh, you know about rare borderline cases. Not every human being is uh, is 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 you know is is like the norm. And, uh, and 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 I think historically religious communities always knew about things that were were not according to the norm, but the what is what has changed in the last sixty years is that the uh, the, the the traditions that were built uh, uh, on top of the Bible, the, the 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 Christian traditions, the Jewish traditions, those traditions provided what. What people today call guardrails, they they provide a general framework in which people mostly thought, and people who were rebellious or critical or uh, trying to change things or trying to restore things, they, they they always deviated to some you know to to one degree or another from that kind of thinking. What's what has changed is that at this point people are exercising reason in order to destroy absolutely everything, and they really are becoming completely untethered from any kind of guardrails, any kind of you know uh, traditional sensibilities about what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. And and when when you're there, you can you can defend using reason any any evil crazy, horrible thing can be defended using reason. Just, just look, look at the communists, look at the Nazis. The, the, there's endless examples. Thank you. Great. No, and, and that description of the kind of unmoored American youth, there's some very vivid descriptions of it, memorable ones in the book. And again, I, I recommend it to everybody. There's a number of these questions that in the interest, partly in the interest of time, I'll skip, but also partly because some of them ask questions. If I'm not picking your question, it's probably because it's answered in the book. So I recommend that you read the book. Uh, there, it's it's terrific. Uh, one thing that does come up that you don't get to in the book, a couple of people have asked what current American politicians are saying or doing things that are in any way in line with what you're recommending uh, for genuine conservatism. So I think we'll, we may maybe have time to close with that one. In particular, I'll say, you know, you do set a pretty high bar 
uh, for politicians who you expect to not only talk the talk, but walk the walk. Uh, even when it comes to talking the talk, you, you, you talk about what, what kind of standard they should be held to as far as honoring the right things. Uh, I, I, I can think of at least one recent American president who <laughs> really don't seem to have in mind for your depictions of what an American politician ought to be. Uh, so is there anyone who is? Um, or more generally, say, just say, you know, I know the book is not primarily about contemporary politics, but say something about contemporary politics. Okay, look, I, I, um, the, um, one, one of the things that, uh, the, one of the political lessons that you learn from, uh, from the Hebrew Bible, uh, which is then picked up later by, uh, by the rabbinic tradition, um, is that, um, that there are generations in which um, the, 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 the leadership is appropriate uh, and they're at a very, very high level uh, on many dimensions. And there are generations, um, the, the rabbis specifically pick the, the generation of, uh, uh, of Jephthah and the book of Judges as an example. There are generations in which the best national leadership that you can get are, are people who are, um, who are corrupt and terrible in many ways and uh you know so so i i i think it's very very important not not, not to you know to to build a wall between political theory and uh and practical politics uh, but to uh, understand that uh, the purpose of political theory is 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 to try to let you see your way clear more clearly so you know it's trying to tell you you know, what's the right way to go. Um, and the purpose of practical politics is to do the best you can. And doing the best you can to move um, a, a nation out of, you know, this kind of terrible condition, it's going to involve um, all sorts of compromises. And, not, you know, not just about who you, who you vote for, but also, you know, who do you appear with? Who do you ally with? You know, I, 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 in, in, in my business, I, I, I have, I, I, I absolutely have to, and I think that, I, I think this is religiously the right thing to do. I, I have to make, uh, to build bridges to all sorts of people who disagree with me in extremely fundamental ways. And uh, the, the key is to know where you're trying to go and to do everything that you can to steer this generation as far as you're able in in, in that right direction. Well, uh, that uh, that's as close to an answer to that question as we're going to have time for before the, the time is up, which is right now. So let me again thank Professor Hazoni heartily for his, his spending time with us. This has been recorded and I think will be posted somewhere, although I'm not in charge of these things. I don't remember exactly where. But once again, this has been a terrific conversation. Thank you again on behalf of all of our listeners and readers at Public Discourse. Uh, it's been an honor to have you here, Professor Hazoni. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course.